you very much. And thank you very much for the kind introduction. And thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here and happy to be invited. Um, it's always really interesting for somebody like me who works within this field but don't work with the big data but can see the influence the big data have on my field to actually get some more insight and some more knowledge um, into this field. Um, what I'm going to do today is basically that I'm first going to give you a little bit of context. Uh, who am I uh, and what am I? what is my outset of talking? I am a transdisciplinary person. I have a transdisciplinary education. I started out in transportation research. Is was one of those who was really interested in everyday life, um, which is not the biggest thing within transportation research. And then um, after a while, the mobilities paradigm came along, and this is where I realized, okay, this is where I belong, because this is where we look at transportation as something more than getting from A to B to understand all these other things that are also involved in it. Uh, when I have this um, thing, you can say, okay, technology, planning, environment, communities, I say I'm transdisciplinary, which I am, but I am have an overweight towards sociology, geography, and planning, so this is where I get most of my um, academic literature. I have these two pictures on the side. There is one from above and then there's one on street level. And just, just to illustrate that what I'm really interested in is to figure out what goes on at street level. So I'm interested in everyday life, not for the sake of everyday life, but to understand how everyday life and the thing that goes on there are reproduced in certain ways in policy and planning. So it's the connection. And I think one of the big mistakes that we often make, I don't, but a lot of people within academia often make this mistake, is that they look at everyday life as an isolated unit that we can just look at in this small glass bubble and then we can get people to do certain things. And what I'm trying to argue is this is not how it works because everyday life is something everybody has and everyday life is also something we take into policy and planning and academic research for that matter. Um, the mobility's turn, I'm not going to say a lot about, I'm just going to say this one thing that is that the mobilities in plural is basically about understanding how all these different mobilities that we have are interconnected. So it actually doesn't make a lot of sense to look at them individually. And what I can see is that this is exactly what a lot of you are doing. I could see that from your presentations. So if you don't know the literature, I'm just going to say that if you think it could be interesting, uh, the first book that seriously came out that was a big thing was John Uri. He wrote a book called Sociology Beyond Society in 2000. That was the book that kind of started everything. That was the sociology part. In geography, Tim Creswell wrote On the Move in 2006. And in 2007, John Uri came out with the big, thick mobilities Bible um, that basically was a big part of kick-starting uh, a big research field where people are focusing on a lot of different things, but it's basically about trying to understand all the interconnections of a mobile society. And one of the things John writes in the 2007 book is there's too much transport in the study of travel and not enough society and thinking through the complex intersection relations between society and transport. The last thing I should say is also that I'm a qualitative researcher, so I actually don't work with big data. But because I also work with policy and planning, I meet a lot of big data and I see the influence big data has on so many um, planning and policy decisions made. Uh, so you could say what I know, when if we take the keynote from yesterday with the professor that I forgot the name of, I'm really sorry, but the one who was on the screen. Um, the Exactly. When he talked about how his big data could see uh, the differences between the different neighborhoods and that race had a significance, what I can do is I can tell the stories about how the people in the very rich neighborhoods don't know the poor neighborhood. Maybe they heard about it and they're not really aware where it is, whereas the people in the poor neighborhood, uh, they know all about the rich neighborhood. Maybe they don't go there, but they know all about it and they know how many more mobility options they have in that place than they have. So I basically know the content stories of how that actually plays out. Um, so in that sense, it's a really good combination, these things, because we can get the numbers, we can get the movement patterns, uh, but with the qualitative, we also get the context around these things. 
So that's the context. So the next thing is that I have to ask myself the question, why am I here? Because I don't know that much about big data. Um, and I think that it's because I know, and I'm pretty sure you know, and if you don't know, it's very important that you're aware that big data is power. It's big power. Uh, and that actually means that with big data and doing big data research, there is a responsibility that follows along because the research that you are doing is, it's not that, I mean, I'm getting to an age now where I am invited into the municipalities and I'm working with them and the politicians also invite me in. But when it comes to making the decisions, it's the big data that counts. Uh, and that actually means that there is a responsibility and that means you always need to relate to what kind of data, data and which ideas are this data reproducing. Because it does reproduce a certain idea about how society should develop, how society should look, what are the preconditions uh, for this data that you're using. How are they available and for whom, because I think this is also a huge problem that there's so much of it, who can use it. Um, and then this thing that always be aware that data is always mediated. It's collected, it's sorted, and it's analyzed. And one of the things that we know for sure is that uh, most politicians, they actually don't care about uh, the preconditions or the what kind of variables are in. They just look at the results. Uh, so that means there is a big responsibility in what you're actually doing with your research. And of course, I would prefer, because I'm primarily working with sustainable mobility, sustainable transitions of society, of course, I would prefer that you use your big data to push that agenda. But I'm absolutely not saying you should do that if you want to have more cars and that's what you want your data to show, then you should do that, but just be aware of what it is that you're actually doing with your data. Uh, this is what is important. And that means that we play an active role in producing futures. It's not just science, because it is science about society and its development and the development of mobilities. So it is producing futures. Uh, and producing futures actually comes with a responsibility. Um, and one of the things that we have, which is a big issue, and this I'm going to go over very quickly, but it's just because it's one of my things within this power relations on knowledge within this field, is that what this is a very rough model. But it's basically just to say the way it works right now is that policy and planning are very much relying on these uh, economics, statistics, modeling, quantitative methods, because they get a number, they can say, okay, this is how it is, if we do that, this is good, if we do that, this is bad. Um, and this is very often put into this thing called hard measures or hard data or soft measures and soft data. And I always say that it's really crazy that something like culture came into soft measures because there is nothing soft about culture. Culture is a hardcore thing that's really, really difficult to change. But what is it that I want to say with that? In this power relation that we have in these things, we need to get rid of these words. So don't use them. And because they are basically words that are used to create a specific power dimension in what kind of knowledge is valid. So instead, and this is, it's one of my big issues. We need to just learn always to put context on what we want. Never put these words into the way we are describing things anymore because what happens is that we also need soft measures. What is soft measures? What are we talking about? It could be everything. Um, so put context on it. What is it that we want to have knowledge on? What are we talking about? Are we talking about communications? Are we talking about practice research? Are we talking about uh, databases, modeling? Because it's so easy to replace this with words uh, instead of using two categories that are full of power. And I guess you can also see from the pictures that I chose that they're also pretty gendered. But I'm not going to go down that road today. So, But I'm just going to leave that in um, that this is how it works. Um, so let's get out of that. And then I have the next thing, which is my disclaimer. And I normally don't use it at academic conferences, but I'm just doing it here to actually show you what somebody like me, when I go out and present things, not in a setting like this, but I always do it when I go to municipalities or NGOs or wherever I have to talk, I always have this disclaimer because I'm going to say things about the car that people don't like hearing. So I don't have a problem with the technology. I have a problem with its unintended consequences. 
And then what often happens is that somebody says, yeah, but this picture of the unintended consequences is totally, it's exaggerated. And then the only thing I can say is, yeah, but the picture of the car is as well. Because this is how the, um, the industry sells cars, but this is not how it looks when you drive a car. Uh, it never has those kind of surroundings and that kind of speed, most of the time at least not. Okay, so what does that mean? That we mean that we have a system today where the urban planning is still extremely technocratic. And it means that modern planning paradigms are still technocratic with an ideal of flow and zero friction. This is also why some of the discussions we had yesterday on um, cycling and why is it so difficult and why this experiment wasn't possible is because this is a prevalent idea that this is what the aim is for society. Uh, and this dominating neoliberal concept of an economy based on global flows of trade and workforce results in an unchallenged principle of seamless mobility as the pathway for efficient organizations of cities. So it's all about getting as fast as possible from A to B, even if we know that there is so much research um, on how travel time is not dead time, travel time is use time. I have plenty of people saying I don't have a problem with the queue on the highway. It gives me a half hour extra where I have time for myself so I can listen to my ebook or listen to music. Plenty of interviews where people are talking about how they bike a longer route to get a little bit more time on their own because we live in a time pressured everyday life where we have constant activities and for many people we are actually in a place where the transport time is the only time they have to themselves. Um, so it's not that time, it's not about getting it done with or over with. And the problem with is in this tradition the question on why and for what often seems to be missing. Why are we actually doing this? What is the intention? What is very often missing within urban planning is, um, in Denmark, I'm coming up with an example here. In Denmark, they, we have this interesting rule that is that whenever there's a new urban planning project, the police has to approve it. And the police have to approve it for safety reasons. I know in other countries, it, other places it's done, but, and this is basically also the reason why the Tartu project was canceled. It was the safety reason. What is that safety based on? Well, it's based on that the police say that if you make a, a cycle street here, it means that um, there is gonna be less space for the cars, and that means it's not as accessible, and that means it's more unsafe for the cyclist. So there is nothing in the police way of understanding this new urban planning uh, concept as if the whole idea is actually to slow down traffic and if we have a speed limit on 20 kilometers per hour, the ability to actually realize what's going on is much bigger. So that means that the whole pattern of how mobility is done in the street is going to change. This is not what they do. They look at the current situation, how it works now, and this is where they go in and say, okay, this is possible or not possible. And one of the things I tried to say also about Copenhagen yesterday where I said that they're really good at just grabbing small pieces is, for instance, there was a, one of the plans that the police turned down was closing one of the roads. Uh, we have the um, town hall square, then we have the pedestrian zone, and there's a road on both sides. Within urban planning, there is a lot of research that shows you can never get a square to work if it has traffic on too many sides because it needs to have some quiet sides to get people to actually use it. So they wanted to close the street between the town hall square and the pedestrian zone, but the police said no because it was too unsafe. What happened is that five years later, we were building a new metro ring line and that road was closed because it had to be one of the places where the trucks are taking up the dirt while that road was closed because of the metro building, the Copenhagen municipality built a little bit broader sidewalks and a little bit broader bike path. So suddenly when the metro was done and the construction site was taken down, it was a very narrow road space that is now not used very much. So this is how the planners in Copenhagen actually get around these things. But it's just a way to say we have a whole system that is built up around this car uh, as that which is the most important thing. So um, we are planning for the car and there are um, Dennis and Uri, uh, John Uri and Kingsley Dennis wrote a book called uh, 
Automobilities, I can't remember what the book is called, but it's from 2009. And there they're talking about this auto logic, which is an internal growth logic of planning systems and policies, which primarily focus on the accessibility and efficiency of the private car. Even if in a city like Copenhagen, we say we're a cycling city, it's still the car and that the need of the car that comes first. And Nigel Thrift said, uh, to explain how this works, he said, a hundred years or so after the birth of automobility, the experience of driving is sinking into our technological unconsciousness and producing a phenomenology that we increasingly take for granted. And this is basically why I was trying to say the things in the beginning, because I very often see people who are working on cycling, who are working on more... Uh, livable cities, but they still use a language and they still use a taken for grantedness about how these things work that are actually reproducing the car system because it's so unconscious that we're just doing that. We were, we spent the last hundred years to make us so reliant on the car that we don't even think about how much we're taking it for granted. So now you understand why I normally have the disclaimer there in the beginning, right? Because people always get, ooh, you can't say stuff like that. But this is how it works. And it's not that I don't love cars, because I do, but I am one of those strange persons who don't have a driver's license and don't have a car. Um, because I was clever enough to get a partner who has. So I'm the show, he's the chauffeur and I'm the passenger. Um, so what is the consequences of this Planning, yeah, but for most cities, this auto logic resulted in an optimization of the automobile system that intensified and accelerated climate change, the standstill in urban traffic, and the ongoing destruction of public spaces. And this is basically some of these things, the consequences for cities and consequences for uh, urban or rural areas where we have urban sprawl, that is basically only possible to get to if you have a car. And that way the car becomes an a thing in everyday life that you can't do without. So what does this have to be, do with big data? Well, big data as, and the way it's often used by politicians and planners are considered as coded spaces facilitating self-learning, social technical environments grounded in IT and artificial intelligence where software is applied to facilitate the efficient use of resources, space, infrastructure and energy and to provide user friendliness and sustainability. The cool thing about when we talk about big data, sometimes it can just do all that. And it's seen as assemblages of technologies aimed at increasing competitiveness, administrative efficiency and social inclusion. The problem with this is that, and this is why some of the attentive persons might notice that I talk about practice and I don't talk about behavior. Um, I do to say behavior when I'm in a policy context because they don't get the practice thing and I'm not gonna try to explain that. But the difference between those two things is that behavior is basically having an outset in thinking about uh, changing habits as a cognitive thing. We just need to explain to people why this is better or smarter than they're going to do it in a different way. Whereas practice is much more focused on looking at all the related things we do in everyday life and looking at the materialities, the competences and the making of meaning in relations to these things and how that actually matters for how we do things. And what I can see in the things I've seen here the last two, or like yesterday, um, is that exactly those connections is actually a lot of what's going on within big data. But these connections are still not that clear for a lot of policies and planners. One of the big research projects I'm working on right now is about food, mobility and housing in the sustainable transition of everyday life. And it's basically just a small attempt to try to say, okay, we need to collect some of these things that goes on in everyday life and see how they interact with each other. Because we can't, just get, um, the, we can't just get these things changed if we don't see them as a whole that is connected. One of the interesting things we have seen so far, it's only a year old, this research project, so we are in the beginning of it, is that we are, our empirical group are young adults between 25 and 35 who are in this transition phase where they're done with their studies, they start thinking about having kids and all that stuff. Um, and we are talking to people who are in the process of thinking about moving. What is really interesting is that they all have clear ideas on food and waste. Uh, housing is just not on their agenda. 
um, so they they buy big houses without thinking about. So they they are very aware of sustainability. They think about sustainability. They think about climate change. They think it's important that we do something about it. But none of them actually reflects on the fact that when they're buying a bigger house, like this young man who is buying a big house where there is at least five rooms for when he eventually get a family, so it's good to have. Uh, he never thinks about what that actually means in relations to sustainability. And that following that means that he actually has to have a car because now he's living in a place that needs a car. What he thinks about is sorting his waste and um, buying the right food, right? Um, because that is an easy hands-on thing. But the bigger decisions like where you live and how you actually get there is also so much dependent on the way we plan cities, the way policies are made. And it's something we can see so far is absolutely not on the agenda, even with young uh, people who are very attentive to um, climate change and uh, environmental issues. So we need to rethink the concept of smart cities in a wider social political perspective and infuse its discourses with an understanding of all the things cities are and not only which kind of technologies we can put into them. That basically connects to what I said in the beginning. We are making futures with the research we're putting out and what goes into policy and planning. Because when you do something, when you plan something, create new infrastructural projects or new urban spaces, it lasts for a long time. Uh, and it's very often that it can't be used for a lot of other things that the intention that we put into it. And Martin Heyer, who is a discourse analysis, said at some point what we need is smart urbanism rather than smart cities. So we need to think about what it is we do with it. I am part of a big EU project called Cameo, Connected, Automated, and it's almost over and I still can't remember what Cameo means. Connected... Automated, connected, automated, and one thing more. But it's basically about automation. I'm, I'm responsible for the part about smart and livable cities. And we had a workshop in Copenhagen before Corona. Uh, what was really surprising about that workshop, and it also surprised me, was it's with Australian partners, and Mobile Lab Tattoo is also part of it. Um, and came to German University as well, came to Copenhagen, invited a lot of people from the municipalities, um, um, like the, a lot of people on the top in the municipalities, the ones making the decisions, people from the Danish Cyclist Federation, our Smart City Lab, all these people. What happened at that workshop, what was quite interesting was that it ended up being a conversation about how to grab the low-hanging fruits. So instead of talking about how we're going to make everything smart, how are we going to do all these things, it was more about what can we actually do with what we have right here. Because sometimes the whole thing about smart cities is something that we can do in 20 years. And I think most places we are getting closer to and understand that we actually have to do something right now. And I think especially for... One of my colleagues, Anthony Elliott, who is working a lot with automation, it was a huge surprise to come to Copenhagen and we have all this smart city lab and all that stuff and everybody was just talking about, okay, what can we actually do that is easy to do, where we don't have to invent all sorts of things, but we just take what we actually have and, and redo the way we are, our cities are working. Um, so, and this is basically also because one of the things that I love about these things, about automation, for instance, is these ideas about how futures can be that you develop based on technologies and numbers. This is just from the internet. And my favorite picture is the one with the child and the teenage daughter and the dog. I still don't know why the dog needs to get driven anywhere, but that's another thing. And the last thing is, so we actually think that when we get automated cars, that parents are going to change in the way that they have no problem of stuffing their two-year-old into a car and say, bye-bye, honey, and then get to kindergarten the, whatever way they do. Because everybody who have kids, had kids, knows that getting your kid off to kindergarten in the right way, make sure they're happy and everything is good, is basically what influences the rest of your working day uh, and how the week goes. So there are some ideas about how the future is going to look where humans and human needs and human emotions are just not part of it. 
And one of the things that I've been really interested in is actually also watching science fiction movies and stories about futures, predictions about futures. And a lot of it is really true. It's really amazing. Arthur C. Clarke has a movie from 1956 or something on the internet where he's talking about the mobile phone. It's amazing what he can predict. The only thing where he's missing out is this idea that people are no longer going to be humans with emotions and things that matters to them. Because somehow this is one of these things we seem to forget in all this data and all these opportunities and all these technologies that people are still people. They still have feelings, they still have emotions, there are still things that matter to them. And that drives a lot of what they're doing. Um, and this is also why we see technocratic solutions like that. It's super smart, but who want to live in that city? These are the kind of cities we want to live in. We don't want to live in those clean uh, no interaction city. These are the ones we go for. And this is also why I have a big interest in looking into architectural drawings, because this is four projects in Copenhagen, three um, of these new renewal projects, and um, these are all areas where there is uh, very expensive housing, and there are um, supermarkets and small um, uh, what do you call that, businesses, and there are no cars. So 30,000 housing units that needs to have a car because the entrepreneurs don't want to build on this place without having a car. But this is the picture that the politicians are buying. This is the picture that the architects are making. This is the picture that people are buying. So we are basically in a situation where we're selling the lift city, but this is not what we are um, getting with what we're doing, the way we're planning. The human scale city is basically coming a lot from Jan Gehl. I don't know if you know him. He made this how book Life Between Houses that has been translated. It's from 71, so it's an old book in Denmark. It's translated. But it's basically about, it's a scale thing, thinking about how do we actually build cities? What kind of scale do we actually have? And one of the things that we tried to do in Copenhagen was to do these experiments, to get closer to that scale and see how do we actually use street space. It was an idea based on the challenges Copenhagen had in terms of mobility and city space, and especially car ownership that was increasing. And these were the three things they went by. Urban space must be beautified, cyclist condition must be improved, public transport needs to be strengthened. The clever person can easily see that if you do these things, it means there is less space for cars but Copenhagen municipality was clever enough never to write that in. And because they did that, they were allowed to do a traffic trial uh, that lasted for a while. And because, as it very often is with these projects, where people are really mad that they don't get their cars, once they actually see what kind of urban space you get out of it, they turn out to be really happy about it. It became permanent. It's now a planning solution in Copenhagen. This is basically just to show you, like before, the experiment, when the experiment was going on and how it looks after where you can see where the space is used for other modes than cars. Um, and what is this comes from is this whole idea with tactical urbanism, which is basically about short-term actions for long-term change. And the idea is to provide test scenarios or traffic experience that can inform this long-term implementations. And an important part of that is also to promote citizen engagement to create that ownership to the project, because it means a lot uh, for how also the politicians think it's going to work. One of the clever things they did when they had to make the next of these streets, which is another one of the neighborhood streets, was the first street, the business association was complaining like hell. Like they always do, it's the same kind of complaints. If you don't have cars in this area, all the businesses are not going to work. la di la di la di la I think you all heard the arguments. Copenhagen Municipality, they made an investigation and then came out in the press release saying this. We're giving 40 millions to start the work to create an attractive Amble Street. We give the stores and the consumers better conditions by giving more space to pedestrians, cyclists and users for public transport, which constitutes 80% of shoppers in Copenhagen. So that is a really clever way of actually approaching this because the complaints were much lower. Uh, because they basically showed that this idea that you need a car to be a good consumer, it's absolutely not connected, especially not when we're talking city space. And this is, I'm talking too much because now I'm already out of time, but I just wanted to show you this quickly because that was one of these things where they seriously used 
people involvement. They made these two things, what do you want to keep? And then they had another one said, what do you want to have uh, get rid of? And by having that container for three months, people were writing notes, putting dots on. They realized after these three months that they wanted everything and they also wanted all the new things. And that was actually a way of making the people living in that neighborhood aware we can't both have uh, playgrounds and green spaces and parking for cars and cycling for the kids when they're in school and parking places. So we need to get rid of something. And this is why they actually ended up taking a cycle street instead of the other street where they have to go down on 20 kilometers per hour. And there's a lot of um, flexible um, Oh, working. Okay, so what is this basically I'm saying? I'm almost done. Uh, <laughs> what am I basically saying? I'm just saying the importance of storytelling. And that also goes from big data. What kind of story is it that you're actually telling? It comes from the argumentative turn in policy analysis and in investigate shift in society's discourse pattern and structures. It basically looks at reg regimes of power. What kind of stories have power? What kind of stories are we actually going with? And these stories, they have a fundamental persuasive character when it comes to making decisions on the future of cities. And this articulation and storytelling enhances what Hayek calls ontological expansion. He says here, it's the transformative capacity of planners to create things that doesn't exist. But this ontological expansion is basically also giving people the opportunity to actually understand what it is that we're talking about, because numbers and text doesn't do the work. This is why we also need the visualizations. You already have a lot of them in the work that you're doing. Um, and they also need to be used politically because it is the tool that we can use to change things. This is just to show some of the work where storytelling is very important. I was part of a, a task force in Odense, the third big city in Copenhagen, no, in Denmark. And they had all these things that they wanted to do climate neutral by 2030. They had two things. They had zero emission zones and they have a traffic plan promoting green active mobility that was about mobility. I said this, this so zero emission zone is not a good idea. It's, I also, I don't believe in just replacing combustion engine with uh, an electrical engine, but different story. But what's interesting about that is that I was totally right because everybody, all the, the people went berserk about the zero emission zones. But nobody really said anything about this traffic plan promoting green active mobility. And the consequences are more or less the same thing. It means a limitation of cars. But they get it when we talk about zero emission. But when we talk about livable spaces, livable cities, it's actually a totally different reaction that comes out. And we need to take that seriously. The 15-minute city is another example of thinking about time, space, rhythms in city. How is it that we plan it? I could say a lot about that because I just started a new research project on it. What I just want to say, which is really important, is that you have to remember that it's the 15-minute city and the 30, 30 minutes territory, because it kind of gets lost in the debate. We only talk about the 15-minute city, but the whole concept is basically also thinking about all, also the smaller cities outside of the bigger cities or smaller cities somewhere else, because it's not about that everything has to be on bike, but that doesn't mean that you can't create centers or small cities into 15-minute cities as well, as long as there is an opportunity to get to bigger cities within 30 minutes. So, what is it that we need to remember? It's the second last slide. I'm sorry. Um, utopias and emotions are important. Utopias, they provide orientation toward futures, and they are paying attention to emotions, but that doesn't equal neglecting rationalities or systemic thinking. Um, um, because emotions create a storytelling that responds to the needs and aspirations of citizens and politicians when suggesting alternative mobility futures. And utopian reflections carry the potential to break through the barriers of convention and create common stories as well as a responsibility towards futures, because this is basically what we need, because what we know from the qualitative research is people are worried about the climate. They want to do stuff, but it's way they can't figure out how to do it. And this is basically where we have a responsibility to help them to find something they can respond to in a way that is um, possible. So this is just saying, so what is it that we need in when we are creating the human city, mobility as a service? Tactical urbanism is a good tool and new storytelling where freedom and flexibility from, comes from not being dependent on the car. My work is very much on the stories we tell about different things, how we create storytelling and use it in everyday life. And 
the, the car is the greatest provider of unfreedom that we have. This is just not how we talk about it. Um, and the smart city should be a place where data is also produced about mobility experiences, preferences, and desires. Thank you. And with this, I just wanted to say my new book, if you think you want to know more of what I didn't manage to say. And then, of course, the Applied Mobilities Journal, where we uh, would always find it really interesting if that, that kind of knowledge we have in this room comes into the journal and also special issues or stuff like that. So just be aware of that. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, no, I, 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 I was sitting, I don't know if you saw me, I was sitting there making uh, notes through all this. I mean, just I think, it's a, I think it's a fantastic set of ideas, which is uh, really important for everyone here uh, at Mobile Tartu, um, you know, particularly thinking about the context and the stories you tell, because I mean, I, I know that most people think, you know, very scientifically about the kind of data and the analysis they're doing, but in a very real, I mean, you're, you're telling stories with the big data. Uh, and yeah, as Milena was saying, the, the stories you tell have, are so much power, and uh, particularly you know, in terms of uh, sustainability, uh, climate change, and the automobile. Um, we're at time. I'm going to briefly open it up and just see if we have one or two burning questions that uh, someone might want to, uh, to ask. Uh, before we move on. If not, Milena's around for, you don't leave No, quite. I have to leave because it's oh. my birthday tomorrow and I wanted to be home on my birthday. So I'm, I'm actually leaving at 11. Okay, well, yeah. okay, we'll, we'll have a little <laughs> time. If there's can anyone I intercept you or do you have to leave now? <laughs> do I what? Do you have to leave now or can I? <laughs> you, can, you can get me. I'm not leaving until after the session. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I meant to ask, uh, you talk about storytelling and it was a very interesting presentation. Um, do you think there is something like a positive bias that should be embraced? And to make it clear, you show all those architect architecture picture. There is never a picture like that when it rains, or when it's cold, or when it's 40 degrees. So what's your take? One should strive for the middle ground, or one should go on the other side and fight car, uh, fire with fire? Hmm. The car storytelling with another opposite, a little bit hmm. probably optimistic storytelling. Hmm. But what I think big data can do, which I think is really interesting, is actually showing some of the unintended consequences because we don't see them. We, we have a situation where we have a technology that kills so many people every year and it injures so many people any, every year. We know pollution is one of the biggest problems. Uh, it, it, and, but somehow all these things kind of drown in the uh, glossy car commercials. If you ever watch television, notice how many car commercials there is during a television show, especially if it's football, then there's even more. Um, so I think actually what big data has the ability to show is all the unintended consequences and the, the, how big, how much it actually is. This is also where I said yesterday this thing that finally we have this number from Copenhagen that 54% of the space in Copenhagen is used for car driving and parking when we think we are a cycling livable city, la di la. So this is our number. And I think this is one of the things that I saw when I looked at all this knowledge there is, it would be great to have these visualizations saying, okay, this is the consequences of this. This is how it looks. This is how much it pollutes. Because I think it's not that the knowledge is not there. It is, it's been like for, I don't know how long, this is always how I start my book. It's a problem. We've known about it for like 40 years, but getting the big data to actually visualize what does it actually mean? I think that has an enormous power. And okay, what is the you. middle ground? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'm, fortunately, I'm, I'm going to have to stop there because my, run, my one job is to keep, keep, yep. keep everything going on time. But, but another round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you.